Welcome to the FML Podcast, the podcast on a mission to uncover actionable insights, explore the latest trends, and to catalyze your fintech's growth. Join Growth Gorilla's founder and managing director, Shamir Sajdev and some of fintech's hardest-hitting marketers and leaders. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the FML Podcast. We're joined by Tierney Coap, Growth Campaigns Manager at Monzo. Tierney, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. You're actually the second person from Monzo to uh, jump onto our podcast. I heard. Richard Cook uh, joined us, I think, probably this time last year. For all of those listening, if you, if you uh, haven't uh, listened to that episode and you want some thoughts on organic social, check out the episode. But today, we're going to be talking about campaign experimentation. Before we jump into it, Tini, for everyone listening, can you just share a little bit about yourself and, I suppose, your journey so far and how you ended up at Monzo? For sure, yeah, absolutely. I would second that recommendation. Everything that Rich talks about is incredible and he's really talented in that space. Um Thanks for having me on. I'm Tierney. Yeah, I, I'm from Cambridge. I live in London. I've lived here for about 10 years now. My kind of career journey is very different to what I do now. I did not work in fintech prior to working at Monzo. My first job out of uni was actually um, doing PR for a kind of British lifestyle retailer called Oliver Bonus. It was a sort of time in my career when it was like, pick up what you can, learn what you can. So I ended up doing a bit of organic social and that's how I learned paid social as well and then it's kind of you you turn your hand to what needs to be done really don't you so um yeah really learned tons there learned on the job and decided to sort of specialize in paid social from Oliver Bonus I moved into the world of digital publishing I then started working at a number of a mixture really of like daily UK newspapers so I worked at the Telegraph I worked at the Independent as well as kind of more online lifestyle media so I worked at Refinery29 I absolutely loved working at Refinery it's, it was just such an amazing experience the team was so fantastic and I just really believed in the content that we were making and that that sort of commitment and belief in the, the stuff you're producing in your work is definitely something that I really carry through to Monzo, one of the reasons why I wanted to work there. So yeah, after kind of working in publishing across those brands, moved to Monzo and I've been there for just under a year and a half now. Started out working in the growth marketing team as a paid social specialist. So working across kind of TikTok, Meta, Snap. Um, but I've actually just recently taken on a new role, which is super exciting. I want to ask you about your new role, uh, but before we do, for everyone listening and, and on the off chance that they haven't heard of Monzo, briefly explain who Monzo are and what they do. For sure. So yeah, Monzo is a, a bank in the UK. Um, we don't have branches. We're an app-based bank and we have over 8 million customers now in the UK across uh, personal banking and business banking. And really, it can be pretty much summarized as simply as we're, we're here to make money work for everyone. Um, Mondo is a, a bank that's really, I guess, founded on the ethos that, you know, things weren't really working and it wasn't easy for the average person. It wasn't accessible. It didn't kind of answer like both practically and I suppose on like a, a mental level, the needs that the average person has for their money. Like money is such an important thing, right? Like it's, it's such a personal topic and it's so ingrained in nearly everything that you do. And so to have, I guess, kind of company mission is stacked upon that, right? Like we're, we're essentially trying to make your interactions with money as easy and as simple and as easy to understand as possible. Cool. Let's, let's jump into your role. So you've taken on this role as growth campaigns manager. Obviously, First question is, to tell us more about that role. What will be your remit? You know, what are you going to be your areas of focus? For sure. Yeah, it's a super interesting role. It's, I think the easiest way to sort of summarize it is I am working pretty much in the intersection between brand and performance. It's quite common, certainly in my experience, that those two things don't necessarily always work together and, you know, think about the same objectives, like how are we going to measure what we're doing? What are our kind of aims for any given campaign those two things can be almost opposite um, if you're not communicating really well up front and thinking about how actually you can achieve multiple aims at the same time so I guess my remit is going to be thinking about 
all the campaigns that we might do coming up at Mondo and really trying to bring that relationship a bit closer. So thinking about how can we achieve anything we want to achieve from sort of a brand aim standpoint. And those those campaigns might be more kind of awareness or consideration focused. And then plus, how do we also continue to really push and drive on our conversion aims as well? Thinking about how, how do we build up brand familiarity, engagement all the way through to conversion? And the best thing about it is it means that I get to just work with so many different people across the business, so within marketing, but also beyond, um, which I absolutely love because the team is just incredible. So it's a really fun thing to be able to do to kind of touch all of those different elements of marketing. In this role, and in, in I suppose your previous role, experimentation is, you know, is, has, will be a big part, you know, obviously off performance, but definitely between trying to get that balance between brand and performance as well. Especially taking into consideration your background, you know, you're not a fintech purist, you know, you kind of worked across sort of publishing, e-commerce, et cetera. You, you've been at Monzo for a year and a half already. How has that journey shaped your approach to campaign experimentation. Yeah, it'd be great to hear more about that. Going into FinTech when you haven't had a finance background is, it can be pretty daunting. It certainly was for me because I think, you know, when you work in publishing, you're pretty much, you're weighing up brand risk every day with the, the content that you're working on and the campaigns that you're working on. Your primary objective is like, how do we get people to engage with this content? How do we get people to care? How do we get people to read it? Going into FinTech, it became quite clear to me like immediately that there's a lot more to think about in terms of kind of regulatory bodies guardrails which makes complete sense right because as I said earlier money is such an important and sensitive thing for for everybody that it makes complete sense to have that additional rigor around what you can and can't say as a marketer in the finance space but it is quite a it's quite a scary thing to sort of you know, you worry, am I going to say the wrong thing? Or like, how how will we get this campaign through? Like, how many steps are we going to have to go through? Who's going to need to see it? When it comes to experimentation, I suppose there's a tendency to feel like, oh, I'm going to just stick to the what's really simple here. And I'm not going to try and push the boundaries because of all those additional sort of guardrails, I suppose. But yeah, in practice, my experience at Monday has not really been like that at all in terms of they made it so easy to understand like that is integral to our mission it's also integral to the way that they kind of onboard the team and train people up and so yeah right off the bat I was pretty comfortable and you know it was really clearly explained to me here are your goalposts these are the kind of areas we cannot move beyond when it comes to what sort of experimentation you might want to do but within that there's a really kind of strong appetite in the business I think for experimentation and innovation um, and testing things and there's a real openness there so I think yeah we we definitely have to continue to think about what are the limits of what we can do and what we should do by right of our customers but there's also yeah like a really fun and sort of dynamic approach within the team to experimenting which we try to take advantage of. What is the I suppose the Monzo approach or the t &E approach to setting up experiments you know where, where's your kind of starting point you know what things are you looking at and kind of what does that framework look like? Yeah, I think one of the things that we always think about is customer feedback. That was pretty much how the business got going in the first place, right? Like it's word of mouth. It's we in the very early days, Monza was very um, engaged with any time there was a new release. They would ask people, you know, what do you think of it? What should we do better? How should we change it? Um, that spirit is very much still part of what we do when it comes to experimentation. And so listening to what people have said, what's worked well in the past, where we've seen really good traction and kind of engagement in campaigns previously is definitely, I'd say, like the starting point. It also then depends on where the campaign is going to be or where we're looking to reach people, right? So I guess in the same way I was talking about innovation, that's something that we do pay attention to as well when it comes to experimenting with new channels, for example, like if we see that something's come up where our customers or our audiences are spending a ton of time, we do think about how we can engage in that place in a way that makes sense and sort of adds value to the mm -hmm. people who are spending time there and doesn't feel like we're sort of just inserting ourselves in a place where it doesn't, we're not really wanted as a brand, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think we're always trying to weigh up how we can 
add to the conversation in a way that feels supernatural, but keep in mind what people actually want from us. I want to drill down into, um, specifically, I'll talk about sort of experimentation on, on, on ad creative. I think the, the world of TikTok, uh, and I suppose the, the growth of the platform itself, has kind of brung about, you know, short form video um you know as a creative piece i think kind of prior to, to to sort of tiktok we were living in a world of basically instagram and facebook with a sprinkling of youtube and i think like tiktok kind of came along and to a certain degree it's kind of almost like it's activated youtube and insta a little bit more and it's been kind of like that that missing piece and we've got this you know this trifecta now of, of of channels but at the same time as well sorry carry on no it's i was just gonna say like tiktok has been a real game changer for us Personally, I'm obsessed with it and spend like way too much time on it. I would, I don't even look at my screen time anymore because it would just be like embarrassing the amount of time that I spend on TikTok. But yeah, like from a from a Monzo standpoint, it is it's been a really interesting channel for us over the last year and has really made us think about. So you were talking about ad design and kind of making creative for specific channels. It, that has really forced us to think quite differently. It's been really interesting. The world's moved away from, you know, static images and carousels and you could run a campaign and get good results with that. But I suppose the, the introduction of UGC and short form video and whatnot, or licensed content or whatever, has been a game changer in, in, in engagement. But yeah, it, it brings about the issues around how do you spin up that much creative at speed and then run experiments because there are now so many more factors to it. So I'd really love to hear about yeah, the approach of tailing creatives for, I suppose, channel by channel, and then kind of like the experimentation piece that goes behind that. And then I suppose also at campaign level as well. Yeah, it'd be great to kind of think about, you know, you understand what, again, the, the Monzo slash TNE framework is <laughs> for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, TikTok, I think, is a heavy lift to get started. I think that's a fairly like widely held belief and kind of experience that if you're like we were in a position probably a year and a half ago now or a year ago where we really didn't have a high volume of vertical video content right like we had the legacy like historical static content that we've been using across meta we had a lot of like card imagery we had a lot of animated content but we did not have a lot of like someone talking to a camera about something that feels really authentic and natural and funny that's like stepped in the right way and just doesn't stick out and be feel jarring don't get me wrong we did also like start off our first as experiments on tiktok were reusing content we already had and i think that that's probably true for a lot of brands it's sometimes easier to just like get going with what you have and then try to build upon it and change it up as you go, rather than like what I wouldn't say is wait until it's perfect. It's sometimes, in my experience, a bit better to just like try something. And yes, you can be aware of the fact that, oh, in an ideal world, it would look like this. And we'd have creator-driven content live on TikTok. Obviously, that's what's, you know, driving the engagement across the platform. But at least getting going allows you to get a sense of, what people are talking about on the platform and just it forces you to be involved in that conversation so that's what we did we got going we we tested stuff that we already had and then thought okay cool like what do we actually want to do here and that that i think is from my perspective how i always approach ad creation the only the thing that i think about primarily is like what would i want to watch here which is maybe like quite a a self-centric attitude to um, producing content, but I think it's a pretty good like line in the sand for anybody when they're thinking about what sort of content they should make for different channels. What would you watch here? What sort of TikToks would you want to see from a finance brand? Like what would be interesting or valuable for you to learn? That educational factor is also super interesting or kind of relatability, giving people insights into their own experiences with money. And so that's a really interesting angle you can work through creators, for example, like, you know, asking them to talk a bit about their experiences with money or like funny situations that they encounter that are kind of awkward. And how does Monzo therefore have a role to play? Splitting the bill is a really good example of something like that. So it can be quite fun in a channel like TikTok to really bring to life that weird awkwardness that we all seem to feel when it comes to like 
splitting a bill with somebody. So I think in terms of content that works well for TikTok, that area that's like, here's a scenario that feels very relatable and very common to a lot of people. And then think about how authentically Monzo does have a role to play in that conversation. That's definitely how we approach our, our vertical video content, I think. Talking about vertical video, and that's largely about TikTok, I suppose, do you take the same approach? I mean, are, are you repurposing effectively the content that you're putting on TikTok into Insta and into YouTube Shorts? Or have you taken a slightly different approach with those channels? It kind of depends. I think it's about where is it worth you investing in bespoke content versus where mm. will it be you know, okay and not jarring to the ecosystem to reuse some content. I think it depends, like TikTok, I think is a good example where we're seeing really strong success. So for us, it's worth it to produce kind of bespoke stuff that's specifically for TikTok. An area, again, I keep sort of circling around the idea of creators and influencers, but that's an area that's, I think, pretty relevant to this discussion because it's sometimes hard to reuse that content across multiple channels, for example, if the person you're working with is really big on TikTok but doesn't have an engaged following on Reels, for example. So sometimes it maybe just doesn't make a lot of sense if you are also like leveraging that organic engagement. But for other things, if you're working with a content creation agency, maybe who are producing like BAU always on content, that's very much about like features and benefits. Yeah, absolutely. We could reuse that across multiple channels um, as long as you're thinking about the main, the main challenges like from an, a creative production standpoint I guess are going to be things like music usage on different channels um, and placement of the UX it's slightly different but yeah those are just considerations that we just bake in when we're making stuff. Moving away slightly from vertical content you know I do go on Instagram from time to time and I do see the, the occasional Monzo ad. Mm. Um, <laughs> Good hope you click. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, I'm already a customer oh, of Monzo, okay, so if I click, you don't want me to click, you, you know, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to bump the CPL up, because um, obviously that vertical content, especially when we're using individuals who are doing that sort of, you know, speaking into a camera or that you usually see in a style piece, how do you try and make sure that that sort of dovetails nicely with perhaps the more traditional sort of static images or the animated ads? And then again, I suppose the un- knowing the underlying tone of this conversation is about um experimentation you know how did you kind of get to that point that is the eternal question isn't it like that's i think it's really hard that's a really hard one to crack how you make stuff feel that there's a a kind of common creative thread when you're working with different media types that appear quite differently so like a person talking to camera that feels supernatural on tiktok versus like maybe something which is a slightly higher production weight for youtube because we know it's going to appear on connected tv or like yeah, your, your kind of traditional flat card imagery that we would use on Meta because um, we know that that is what drives a really good kind of conversion for us. And all of those three things do have the potential to feel really different. I think everyone's still working this out, what the best way to approach it is. I think I'm we're fortunate and I'm fortunate to work at a brand like Monzo that has such a clear, defined brand, right? Like we have, there are lots of things that you could allude to when it comes to Monzo that like feel very Monzo. So it, it could be the hot coral color. I think color is like a really interesting way that you can drive that creative thread through different placements when you're experimenting across different channels. It could be sound like that, the catching noise that you get when you get money deposited into your account is also like a really kind of important brand to you for us. So I think anything that you can do to sort of thread that needle across different channels is going to help you feel that it's like slightly more joined up but it is a really tricky thing to do and I think yeah in terms of experimentation for us right now I think we're really trying to stress test how we do that and find the best way to do it right like experimentation for us is an always on thing we're always testing we're always seeing what we could do better we're always trying out yeah new placements working we work really closely with the kind of the platform partners that we have and all of the teams we work with are so so great so you know we, we're always asking them like what new products are you coming out what basis have you got what placements have you got coming out i guess kind of like circling back to what i spoke to off the top where we just want to make the best use of the placements people care about and so if the, the 
platform to release something that's like a really interesting new area that's going to drive like a ton of engagement so like takes threads for example when something like that came out we think about is there something that we can add here as a brand is there something that we could and funny enough rick cook is there was the mastermind behind our our threads approach when it first came out but yeah we, it's just something that we always think about of where are the places people are interacting how can we continue to test what we do better monzo's in a an advantageous position like you said because you've got quite a mature brand and, and let's be honest here as well you know you, you you've got reasonable budgets to be playing with as well so there's always going to be a you know it's going to be much easier to carve out some some budget to test out a new feature or a new area you've got some resource behind that as well and i think there's a lot of um you know i, I want to sort of move away you know it's probably not some not advice for startups or even scale-ups to a degree but more the sort of established players i think there's a lot of established players out there in the market um not going to kind of mention any names, but I think they're missed. You know, they, they probably share similar sort of budget sizes and resource sizes as Monzo has, but they're probably missing out on some of those opportunities because, you know, when I'm on my Instagram or my TikTok or, or YouTube or whatever it is, they're not doing those things. I'm not seeing those sort of similar sort of placements that say Monzo or a couple of other brands that you know are, are doing as well. And I think they're staying in in very very much almost like a safe space, both like from a targeting placements and, and, and creative perspective. But then I suppose that's also why Monzo has seen kind of the growth that they've seen as well, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it is a really, it's a hard conversation to have. I think to the, to the point around kind of getting people on board and testing and getting stakeholders bought into the idea of doing something when you just simply don't know if it's going to work or not, that is a really hard thing to do. Like you kind of said, we are really lucky and the team at Monzo is very bought into testing as a strategy. My advice on that would really be, it's sometimes really helpful to frame it as we don't know what's going to happen, but whatever happens, we will learn something here. So I think that would maybe me, maybe be my advice if, you know, it's a challenge that you have in your business of, oh, I feel like I can't get budget unlocked test things because stakeholders really just want to see the numbers on the bottom line I think that there's a there's a feeling to that too right like your approach has to continue to change and innovate otherwise it will not work the same way forever like things that worked really well for us a year ago for example do not work the same way for us now so I think if you just continuously you know invest in one strategy and think yeah okay take meta feed ads for us are working really well and you know we're just going to continue to do that forever that's not always going to work so ultimately there is going to need to be some sort of testing and expansion to reach new people even like you will if you continue the same approach on the same places you'll you'll only cap against a certain amount of audience too right so i think testing is is a bit of a scary word for stakeholders i suppose so framing it as like we're expanding here and we're trying to take advantage of new opportunities. And yes, we don't know what's going to happen, but if it doesn't work, then at least we can sort of pivot from that and not not do that again. You've got a 100% chance of not scaling if, if you're not testing. It's a really, really good point around sort of like, you know, framing it as learning. I think my relationships tend to be with, say, heads of marketing, CMOs, and then the CEOs. Whenever I'm sort of speaking to the CEOs, you know, the message I'm always trying to sort of communicate to them is um, you know, give your marketing team like almost like room for failure. Mm, because I love that. If you're going to be really, really hard on the bottom line, it stops them from taking risks. And sometimes those risks are the ones that really end up paying the big dividends and bringing in the results. Going back to the early days of TikTok, for example, the first set of ads that came on TikTok were basically repurposed vertical video ads that were on Instagram. Somebody was bold enough out there to go, actually, let, let's get one of our creators or, or I'll get on the camera myself and, and stick an ad up there and let's see what happens. That individual probably, you know, had the confidence of, of his or her stakeholders that allowed them to take that, do that experiment. And without that, we would all be sitting here running static uh, it was it animated ads on TikTok and you know how boring would that be exactly that like it's it I think it's about communication too like I'm really fortunate because my my senior stakeholders are so great and so supportive and really encouraged that sort of like taking chances that you're you're talking about 
if you're not in that situation, it probably feels quite disheartening. So I think also communication is a really important thing. I think there's a a fear, right, whenever you try something new that it's not going to work. So I think the worst thing that you could possibly do in that situation is like squirrel it away and be like, okay, I'm going to launch this and I'll let you know how it goes and I'll get back to you in two weeks when it's over. That's the worst thing you could do. The best way to kind of tackle it, I think, is to just really bring people along the journey with you to at every stage, like have check-ins, say like, oh yeah, like, you know, we're seeing at the moment that this particular type of content really working but actually what we thought was going to happen is, is not what is happening here and sort of give those like mini incremental updates on something that you're trying that's new rather than yeah like wait till the very end and then all of the learnings come in at once I think that really helps build up that like test behavior and the trust in a way which I think could be a bit of a hopefully unlock something just sort of talk about managing stakeholders and and you know framing conversations and whatnot you know regardless of of how um supportive your your you know your line manager is you're still going to have to report on on some numbers and kpis what are the sort of metrics or kpis that you you look at and i suppose the business is looking at when you're sort of looking at the impact and i suppose the effectiveness of of you know creative that you're producing it's a hard one to answer because I think it really depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. So I think the answer around KPIs is pretty much agree them up front. <laughs> I think I think you can only measure what you know you're looking for. And it sounds like a really reductive approach and like a bit of a cheat answer. But I think there's no standard way of measuring all types of content. I think it really depends. So like, are you doing something where the objective here and what you're trying to achieve is to get someone to share your video or you're trying to get them to do something that's kind of a like content provocation and we say something and then it want, makes people want to respond with their own piece of content. A good example of that is something like the Year in Monzo campaign that we've just run. The way that we measure something like that is so different to how we would measure our like always on growth oriented activity where we're just trying to kind of reach new users and get people to sign up for a, a Mondo product. So I think being super clear upfront what it is you're measuring and why is the first thing in that conversation. But I think, yeah, there, there are certain things that we look at. So if we're talking about something that's more consideration focused, then it's going to be engagement, reactions, social shares, VTR to a certain degree, but I think view through rate is a bit of a misleading thing sometimes because ultimately there is like a bit of a ceiling, um, particularly for paid content. Like if I were to see like a 100% completion rate on an ad, I'd be shocked, right? So you know there's, there's got a, there are caveats to all of these things. Then with lower funnel, it depends on how your business measures like their single source of truth, right? So you could either take the approach of like we, we assess everything on a last click attribution model, some brands, and this is definitely a conversation that's super interesting to me is around like MMM, do our own sort of bespoke form of measurement. I think it can be quite hard for a single brand to stand up and say like, this is the best way to do measurement, because I think ultimately it is so dependent on the individual needs of your business and what value different stakeholders place on different metrics. So I think as long as within the work that you're doing, everyone you're working with broadly agrees that the KPIs you're looking at are the important ones to look at, that is the best approach to take rather than me sit here and say, oh, you should look at CPA and you should look at CPC. Like there are things that are common, but ultimately if it's more bespoke to your own business, I think that's the best solution. I 100% agree with you. Yeah, definitely agree the KPIs up front. Making sure that you're measuring those and measuring them accurately, and so you know you've got all of your tracking set up. I think there's also the element of I think the point you made about it, it, it can vary from campaign to campaign, and, and I do see that mistake a lot. You know, e even with a lot of you know established organisations where they're applying the same set of KPIs to a uh, an influencer campaign as they are to say a you know almost like a search or performance campaign. And I think that that's a big miss. I think it's been really clear that what is this bit of activity going to do for us? And then I think the third thing as well is, is it's common sense factor as well, right? So, and, and, you know, we kind of come across this a lot, which is, you know, we're, we're running some um, activity, say on, on, on Facebook, Meta, TikTok, or whatever it is. 
the click through rates are pretty average. You know, the, the conversion rate might be not fantastic, but suddenly the you know the organic brand results on search have started to climb significantly. And you know, no other activity has been run anywhere else. You know, there's a moment of like, whoa, where where are they finding out about our brand from? You know, no one wakes up one morning and go, oh, I'll just I'll just Google this company's name. You know, I think it's just looking at some of those sort of underlying factors as well. Mm. Oh, yeah, I would definitely agree. But yeah, with that. yeah, but hundred percent in terms of yeah, green green the KPIs up front. It, it, so just just feel of a um, going on a bit of a detour here. Have you seen the the, the latest uh, news about um, the campaign that Snoop Dogg did? Yeah, with the smoke and fire pit, and they, they fired the CEO, right? Yeah, um, or he stepped down, or whatever. And I think everything we're just talking about here is a result of not doing all of those things, right? Which is to say that they probably didn't agree to KPIs up front. They haven't really thought about, well, what is this campaign going to deliver for us? And I don't think anyone's applied the common sense factor because actually I think the amount of brand awareness that that campaign bought, I think it's brilliant. I thought it was a great campaign, but I don't think anyone's actually looked at, right, right, how do we now, instead of bollocking the CV, uh, see, uh, see the CEO even, how do we now capture all of this awareness and then turn it into demand? Mm, I think I just it, think, yeah. You know, yeah it, it just came to you while you were talking about it. It was a great awareness exercise for Snoop Dogg, I think. Um, I think that's, that's just like on a, a personal note when I was looking at it, I was kind of thinking like, that's a really interesting choice of partner because sometimes working with someone who is that high profile, I can imagine that is the driving factor for the campaign, right? So maybe actually the, the retention of the brand gets a little bit lost unless the execution is like watertight. So yeah, it is, it's interesting. And it's, it's, I think the point about, yeah, agreeing what you're trying to get out of something um, is just a really important thing to remember. But also like sometimes, as to your point, sometimes what you think is going to happen is not what happens. And it is easy sometimes if you, agree a set of KPIs up front and you're like right these are the only things we're going to look at and this is how we're going to measure success it is also easy to then lose sight of like other things which matter beyond the specific campaign you're looking at so I think uh, what I mean by that is like if you're talking about a growth campaign for example and you're like very clear that we want to measure volume of acquisitions and we've got a specific target cost that we have to hit here it can be easy sometimes to lose sight of the fact of like what's next so like, yes, it's all very well bringing people in the door, but how are we going to then get them to stay and get meaningful value out of our product and, you know, explore other products that maybe they didn't come in. You know, like, you know, there are certain reasons we know why people might want to join Monzo. A big one from a seasonal standpoint is, is travel. So like going on holiday and being able to pay for things abroad with no fees. Those sorts of things are like drivers why somebody might join. And so therefore, if we're running a campaign around that, we might go, okay, we're going to look at the amount of people who say in their onboarding survey that they've joined because they want to use us to travel. But there are so many reasons beyond that why people want to stay. And, you know, the amount of different products that we, we have now at Mondo is just ever increasing. And so, yeah, to think about how do you then measure what people do next can be sometimes at full something that falls off a little bit in the context of the campaign. Yeah. So I think that like longer term vision is also something to keep in mind. Yeah, 100% agree. I think to, you know, kind of go to the top of what you were just saying, which is, yeah, sometimes what you think is going to happen doesn't happen. And it's, yeah, taking stock of, okay, well, how do we now take advantage of that and, and you know, do all of these? You know, we, we, we had a, um, a situation when I was marketing director at the, the, the trading company I was at, and we used to run campaign ads in, in Money Week because we were going after sort of a, a mid to high net worth audience. So we were pushing our CFD product because you can offset that against capital gains tax. Mm. We didn't get a single CFD, an increase in, in the CFD accounts oh, really? come off of that. And it was one of those moments of like, oh, right, why did that not work? you know, it should have been perfect for us. And then we started digging a little bit deeper and we noticed that all of the spread betting account, the numbers for the spread betting accounts were actually going up. And what we found was, was that our original USP of how you can offset again, because you can go short on the markets with CFDs, when we were talking, you know, for, for high net worths, when they were getting on the phone with the salespeople, the sales team were then actually speaking to them about spread betting, which is completely tax-free. And they were pushing them into the spread betting product instead. So we actually were, and actually in the end, when we looked at the attribution of everything, the campaign done really, really, really well. 
and you talk, but there was two things that were you know learned from that. The channel was perfect for us, but actually offering that proposition to that audience was incorrect. But luckily, my sales team saved it. <laughs> so the yeah. next campaign that we did, we pushed the spread baiting product in the same place. Okay. Went smoothly, and it became a, you know a, a, a bit of BAU basically in terms of ongoing activity. We've kind of covered a lot of topics here in the things that we've just been speaking about. Nicely moves into, I suppose that that balance between you know kind of I suppose your role really now sort of brand and performance. So I suppose the question is, how do you and how do your team kind of achieve the balance between, I suppose that cohesive brand identity and then catering to all the diverse channels. You spoke a bit about color and sound, but is there any any other considerations that that I suppose brands should, you know, anyone listening should take away from this? Yeah, I guess beyond the sort of visual things that I've mentioned or like the kind of the sound cues, like your brand attributes, I guess the other thing that comes to mind in that sense, particularly in the case of Monzo, is it's, it is quite hard when you are an app, <laughs> which sounds like a, yeah. a, a a simple thing but you don't necessarily have such like a tangible thing to show all the time so yeah like on tiktok for example it, it's not like we're a, a personal hair brand or something like that where like i can show somebody using the product in a way that's like an extremely visual thing um and that's your kind of visual thread that runs through your content and balances the brand i think so being an app I guess the only other thing to think about is is how you can incorporate UI in different placements where it makes sense and to different degrees. So, yeah, the way that we might incorporate like app screens in our TikTok content, for example, is going to be different to how we might use it in animated content that's going across Snapchat, for example. But having it present in both spaces also helps to sort of balance that that brand thread throughout them. So I think... Yeah, if, it, if it's on TikTok, it's like actually showing someone interacting with the different places in the app to really bring the product to life. It might be then showing them using their card, like out and about doing like a spend along with me and day in the lifestyle content in the context of a vertical video platform. But then we're just using like flat card imagery somewhere else on Meta, for example. So I think use what you do have as a, as a digital business that can sometimes feel a little bit intangible, I think. but if you're smart about thinking about, okay, this is my product at the end of the day, and this is what people will feel from Monzo, this is how they interact with us. If you can bring that to life, I think you've done a, a big step in bringing the brand to life. One of the things that Monzo is obviously very, very well known for is us as being very customer centric. And again, kind of like just to dig into to something that you mentioned a little bit earlier on, which was taking customer feedback and then using that as part of your creative process. It'd be great to kind of dig into that a little bit more, you know, you know, what, what does that process look like and how does that shape your campaigns? It's really, I'm laughing because this is something that I, I find super interesting and it's something that I kind of have a love-hate relationship with, but it's such a valuable source of information, right? And that is social comment. I spend more time than I probably should, like combing through comments on all of our placements because I just think it's so interesting to get that kind of anecdotal feedback and like unfiltered feedback as well, right? Like people will comment things about either the content or about Monzo in general, things that they like, things that they don't like. And that all of that is really helpful and insightful for us to take into our approach from like a creative campaign standpoint. I think, so like a good example of that is, I mentioned splitting bills earlier. It's a really interesting creative territory because I think everybody has such a different opinion about what's the right thing to do in that situation. Like some people would die on the, the hill of like, oh, we buy rounds and I would never ask somebody to like split a 15 pound bill with me. Whereas some people are like, you owe me seven pounds and 53p and I'll send you a Monzo request for it right now. Like there's, there's such a diverse attitude because money is, as I keep saying, it's so like emotive. It's such a thing that people feel passionate about um, as they rightly should. So I think, Thinking about those kind of like relatable money moments and content areas, like those, that's what our social team, our organic social team do just so incredibly well. Like I'm in awe of the content that they make because they really tap into that mindset of like relatability and things that people can understand and take that kind of feedback that we hear from people as to what they care about and what's important to them 
in the context of money and then make that into the content we produce so I think yeah that's a real thing that I feel really passionately that we do at Monzo and I'm really proud of that we do it in that way from a sort of ad standpoint or a paid standpoint it was summarized to me at a TikTok of a web event that I um, spoke at a little while ago in the best way and this is how it was described so they said think of TikTok I guess as the best party you've ever been to and every video is like a different room in that party and there's something different going on in each place as a brand when it comes to incorporating customer feedback I guess we always try to think about what room does it make sense for us to be in right like as a finance brand yes of course we are going to be able to add to conversations about money attitudes and how can I get paid early if I get my my salary paid into Monzo like practical solutions but equally like how how from a more like lifestyle and culture standpoint do we also have something to say in a way where it feels like oh yeah you actually have a place to talk in this room because the people who are already there want to hear from you there's nothing worse than like going into an area where you're like I'm really trying to shoehorn our brand here into this discussion, but actually customers and audiences are like, "Mm, I don't really see like what value you're adding to this conversation. So I think that's what we try to be really mindful of when it comes to incorporating customer attitudes or customer feedback um, into our campaign content is like, how can we be additive and improve the conversation and do something that's like fun or interesting or engaging or educational? and bring that to life without yeah trying to just shoot on where it doesn't belong you you kind of actually dropped a, a bit of knowledge there and, and, and i was you know my question was going to be you know what would be sort of like one key takeaway but i think it, it's probably a really big takeaway but i really i just wanted to go through kind of like some of the other key points that you kind of dropped throughout this conversation and, and very very quickly I, you know just just running through it i think the first point you made was being clear around sort of or setting up sort of guardrails or boundaries you know, within the organization for, I suppose, for the marketing team in terms of, you know, where they can experiment within. The second bit was around sort of customer feedback, obtaining it, and then obviously utilizing it. Um, The third point that you made, uh, which I thought was really, really good, which was get going, build on it, and and, and then build on it. And experimentation is always on. And then from a stakeholder management perspective, frame is learning, uh, and agree KPIs up front. Is there any pearls, any other pearls of wisdom that perhaps I, I didn't, I didn't grab? Oh, um, I think the only other thing that I would say, which is is a piece of, sort of advice that I always use as like my get out of jail card whenever someone asks me, like, what's your one piece of advice? It seems really simple, but the only way to continue to like build good campaigns, strong campaigns that feel interesting, is to actually use the platform where they're going to appear. I mean, we've spoken a lot about TikTok. I think I keep bringing it back to it because I'm just such a fan and I love TikTok. But um, that was a really interesting one when it came to the market, right? Like I think during the pandemic is where I really started getting into it and I feel like it really took off from a professional standpoint too. But it was just shocking to me the amount of times that it was coming up in like client pitches and briefs when I was working in publishing, but actually no one in the team had an account. Obviously now it's not it's not really the same in the context of TikTok, but I think the general advice there still applies. To create really strong campaigns, you have to be a super fan of of content and engage with what is out there. Keep, you know, keep your finger on the pulse because it's a way to learn what you like and what you don't like and be inspired by what other people are doing and sort of then incorporate all of those ideas to again, yeah, feel create something that feels really relevant and current for your customers. Yeah, just use the platforms where you're going to be producing campaigns. The more you use them, the more you will learn. Brilliant. I was about to say, though, if everyone follows that advice for TikTok, you know, productivity and marketing <laughs> teams will be significantly everywhere. You can carve out half an hour in your diary. It's work. It's, it's, it's research. <laughs> no, no one spends just half an hour on TikTok. <laughs> I've, 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 lost, I've lost entire days. Mm-hmm. Um, so before I let you go, I'm just going to take you through our quick fire round. What other podcasts are you listening to at the moment? I'm definitely a massive music fan, so I most likely will be listening to music. But if I am listening to a podcast, I am I'm showing my age here, but I'm of the generation of like the BuzzFeed YouTube crew, right? So I listen to a lot of their podcasts. Um, so Perfect Person by uh, Miles Montenuri, I think it's a really interesting one. And then other than Monzo, 
Uh, what other fintech brand or app um, interests you the most? Hmm, I think right now it has to be Zing from HSBC. And then what, what books are you currently reading or would you recommend to our audience? I've just started uh, Yellow Face by Rebecca. I've heard such good things about it and it sounds like it will be really, really interesting. So yeah, I've just got started with that alongside like rereading of Harry Potter for like the hundredth time. Amazing. And then I suppose my last question, probably my favorite question is uh, what's one thing that I haven't asked that I perhaps should have? <laughs> um, well, you could ask me what my year in Monzo era was. Tell us. <laughs> um, I, so I was very unflatteringly in my uh, get a takeaway for no reason era. Um, so yeah, <laughs> clearly 2024 is about like meal prep and cooking. Amazing. Uh, Tierney, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking with you. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you for having me. The FML podcast is brought to you by Growth Gorilla. To find out how our marketing growth experts can boost your fintech's growth, head to growthgorilla.co.uk and make sure to search for the FML podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify or anywhere else podcasts are found. Don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Growth Gorilla, thanks for listening.